All right, welcome to this week's edition of It's All Outdoors podcast, brought to you in part by our good friends out at Sportsman's Warehouse and our deep guys. Always a click away at sportsmans.com. And of course, let's not forget about Respect the Game TV. This week, Larry Mack and I are going to be ripping some lips and talking a little bow hunting with pro angler Jonathan Van Dam. Larry Mack, how did you score this guy? Oh, well, me and Jonathan go back how long? It's been probably three years, I think, now. Uh, we met at a at actually a hunt camp. Really? And what a hunt camp it was. <laughs> <laughs> but, yep, oh, uh, old JVD and, and I, we had a heck of a time out in uh, Nebraska. And uh, we got to talk fishing, we got to talk hunting, and we got to we got to go uh, shoot some bows together and and just have a grand old time. Jonathan, you don't really tell people about that, do you? <laughs> I try not to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, so this okay. So this podcast is gonna go like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm just getting a little equity in here. You know, I'm tired of being at my expense all the time, right, Jonathan? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Little first salvo there. <laughs> well, man, that would have been cool. Hey, now, Larry, where was that at? Was that out with? Is it? Was that out when you was in Nebraska or Montana or where were you? Yeah, we were at Hidden Valley Outfitters uh, with Corey Pearson. Oh, cool! In Nebraska, and it's an early season hunt, which can be challenging, and uh, having a group, good group of guys there is always always great. And uh, yeah, so one of the cool things about Nebraska is being able to, you know, hunt mule deer or whitetail. So early season like that you know people are chasing whitetail in the evenings and and usually uh mule deer in the mornings and uh, we had a we had a heck of a trip that year uh i mean i think i think pretty much everybody everybody had had some success and uh yeah so it was it was a fun trip and uh some fun evenings hearing all those stories uh we had to uh you know give phil a full of hard time he was in camp with us and uh, about every day, wasn't it, Jonathan? We oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Old P. Vitty, he, you know, he does a good job, but you know, it's pretty, pretty easy to rip on a little bit at times. Yeah. The, you know, you know what we call, you know what we call P. Vitty or Philip, don't you, JVD? What's that? He's the hunting hobbit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I call I call him the silverback otter. <laughs> <laughs> the silverback otter. Uh, I forgot about that. That's hilarious. Hey, yeah. so Jonathan, when you're in camp, when you're going, when it, and it's it's awesome that you're not only a professional angler, but you love to, you know, you love to go bow hunting. I think that's awesome. Shaw Grigsby loves to do the same thing. So does Denny Brower, and I, I just think that's great. When you're when you're in hunting camp, though, I got to ask you: Does everybody ask you for fishing tips? <laughs> Occasionally, you know. I mean, <laughs> I, honestly, it's a. Uh, it does happen from from time to time, but you know, for the most part, a lot of those places that we go to, yeah. there's not a whole lot of fishing in the areas. It seems like you know. Oh, I'd be there with a notepad or my iPad, writing notes left and right, man. I'd I'd right, be right. I'd be getting as much as I could for free, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I got I got a few tips on when we were out there in camp. Uh, yeah, just a few little tips on on how to catch them white perch. How to catch them white perch and that grinny or sunfish. Yeah, don't give those away now, Larry. <laughs> oh, I, I, I won't. I won't. Uh, there, there are a little secret. Yeah. <laughs> so how long have you been on Major League Fishing Circuit, Jonathan? Uh, it's been a, been a little while, and I think this is our third year. Um, you know, I started, uh, started fishing with the Bassmasters, and I, I think I did that for 10 years, 10 seasons. Um, and then this will be our third year with major league fishing. So it's, uh, the sports just rapidly evolved and it's just ever changing. It's getting, uh, you know, more and more popular. It seems like lots of different cool, you know, online live viewing options. And, and, uh, it's just, it's, this is amazing how much that it's grown over the years. Yeah, I grew up in the fishing industry with, uh, my family owns a sporting goods store here in Michigan, this DNR sports center. And, um, you know, so I grew up around the sport my whole life. I mean, some people might have heard of my uncle, possibly. Who's that? <laughs> exactly. <right. laughs> exactly. I'm just asking, I, who's your uncle? I don't know. Kevin. Oh, Ke Kevin Van Dam. I, yeah, you might have heard of him occasionally. His face is on yeah. everything in Bass Pro Shops. Uh, he, he's won like, didn't he win like one or two big tournaments? He's won a couple. Of yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He hasn't been yeah. on a Wheaties box yet, though. 
<laughs> right, exactly. I think he was actually. Was he really? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure he was. I think I have that Wheaties box actually. It was uh, years ago. They had him and then they had Denny Brower, I think was. Yeah, on Denny was so, on there. Yeah, Denny was yeah. on there. I didn't know. Yeah. Ke- I honestly didn't know Kevin was on there, but yeah, Kevin's everywhere. I mean. I, I, I've been doing the radio show for 24 years, and I'll be I'll be honest with you. I when I talk fishing, your uncle's name, Kevin KVD's name, comes up almost every show. I mean, he's he's very very well uh, followed in the fishing side. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. He's the man for sure. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. He's almost the Larry Mack status. Yeah, yeah almost, yeah. almost. Uh, uh, yeah, almost exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, uh, you, you and Kevin uh, get to get to fish together much? You know, we don't get to fish together much. You know, or we don't get to share a boat very often. Um, if we do, usually it's at my grandparents uh, chasing bluegills and just having a good time with uh, you know with the kids and and all the cousins and everything. Um, that's something we still do every Sunday that we're home. So uh, we get to go out to my grandparents, live on a little private lake you know mainly mainly uh you know pan fishing and stuff like that but uh you know kevin and i do travel together uh all year on the bass pro tour so um but we don't get to share a boat as often as i'd like to anyways hmm. yeah that's uh that must be something so, so growing up i mean i imagine you know obviously he was he was probably a, a pretty large influence for you uh but have you taught kevin anything <laughs> <laughs> there's been a couple little tricks and nuances over the years that uh that he's picked up for me that i see him in- implementing now <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's oh uh, and well, i bet you le- i would i would make sure he knows about it every time you see it <laughs> <laughs> not anymore i know better than that that's you know, that's the thing i learned i learned over the years that you don't want to get him fired up too much because then you'll be You'll be real far behind in a hurry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't don't uh, po- don't poke the bear. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, don't poke the bear. So, with uh, having your uncle and then your father was a, a a really good. Your father's a good fisherman too, right? Yeah, yeah, he is. You know, he's uh, smallmouth. He doesn't get to does, fish as much as he used to, but does he still have know. the Michigan smallmouth record? It's Ohio, actually. Oh, Ohio. Yeah. Okay. He still has the Ohio State record, nine pound, eight ounce. Wow. That, Small wow. Family. That was in 92 or 94, something like that. Yeah. Man, that's that's a hard family to live up to, man. <laughs> we know our <laughs> way around a fishing rod, that's for sure. Yeah. Who yeah. who else was an influence with you with your fishing stuff growing up? And I had a... Uh, I mean, Kevin obviously was, uh, you know, my, probably my biggest influence and my grandpa, um, you know, he fished a lot and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of it a family affair from the beginning, uh, you know, for us. So, um, but, you know, I, I definitely looked up to, you know, Danny Browers and Shaw Grigsby's and, and, uh, you know, a lot of Rick Kwan, just a lot of the, you know, the, the legends of the sports, sure. you know, that, that, you know, they obviously had an influence. They had an influence on a lot of people's careers, I'm sure, you know, including, um, you know, including some of the greatest names in the sport today. So, uh, you know, those guys are, have a tremendous amount of respect for them and everything they've done to grow the sport. And, and uh, they've definitely uh, had a big influence on, on my career for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I just had Denny Brower on the show last weekend and, you know, Denny lives down in Amistad in Texas and, how, isn't it nice to just retire and go catch 10 pound bass any, anytime you want, you know, what a, what a way to retire, huh? I think he goes to Mexico like every, like once a month too, and goes down there with, and does the, uh, the Ron speed adventure or whatever down there in Camadero. And I mean, like, I mean, that's the life, right? You're yeah. in Texas on Amistad, one of the best bass lakes in the country. And then one, and then once a month, you're going to, oh, let's go to Mexico too. I want to catch a 12 pounder instead of 10 pounder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. My arms just healed up from catching all them ten pounds. We were go we were after twelve. I got yeah, my work done. Exactly. <laughs> oh uh, man. With uh, with everything uh going on with all the platforms stuff changing, ha- did you have to adapt going to the major league uh, bass fishing kind of that, that platform and uh, you know with the different rules and and what what's it like having to adapt to to all of those knowing okay man I just you know fished 
uh, was used to this platform and going there, is there, is there a, a period in which you have to kind of like change your method or, or the way you approach it? Yeah, I absolutely had a, a learning curve there. It's just the, the formats are so different, you know, going from your standard five fish, uh, you know, five fish limit, you know, weight deal, trying to catch the biggest five you could to going to, um, you know, where virtually any fish over two pounds counts. Um, there is a definitely a different approach there. You know what I mean? I still go out and, and trying to, and it, it kind of goes more so for, uh, and I feel like that the format kind of, I'm not going to say takes the luck out of it because, you know, trying to, trying to catch the five biggest fish you can, I mean, you'll get lucky on one or two, but to catch five, you know, better than average fish, you know, you've got the pattern figured out and you figured out what those fish are doing. But I feel like that the new format with the major league fishing, it really, uh, the guy that figures out what stage the fish are in and not necessarily like where the big ones are, um, you know, basically what the best presentation is for the lake on that weekend, just for catching fish. And, and you know, right. And that's what a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of those guys out there that, are you know they're trophy you know they, they target trophy fish but there's you know most of your anglers uh and and guys that are going fishing they just want to get get bit and and just catch fish so it kind of uh it, it was a big big change for me you know mentally to go from just trying to find the five biggest ones to trying to find as many as I possibly can. And it was, uh, it was definitely, it took me a few, a few tournaments to really get a practice strategy down and, and just get a, you know, diff, different strategy for how I wanted to approach each tournament. Yeah. How, yeah. how much does electronics play a part in what, in when you try to target a lake, Jonathan? And now, I mean, nowadays they, they uh, play a massive role in, in, how to approach a lake. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane now how much technology's grown. I mean, and when I started, uh, you know, I started fishing professional events when I was 19. And when I started with that, I had, you know, two graphs on there. They were, you know, six inch, <laughs> six inch screens on them. I had one on the council, one on the, one on the bow. And now, you know, now my hummingbird set up on my boat. Now I've got two 12 inch graphs at the council and three of them at the bow. Wow. So it's just, it's <laughs> insane how much, you know, and, and the technology with the, the, uh, you know, the new Hummerbird Mega Live that's going to be released here in a couple of weeks. Um, and then you've got the 360 and the side imaging and the down imaging and, you know, your traditional 2D sonar and uh, with the map, you know, mapping and all the lake map chips and, and all that stuff. It's, I mean, it's amazing how much, um, it's changed over the years. And I, and I even, I mount an iPad in my, on my boat as well for, you know, Google earth and aerial maps and that type of thing too. So wow. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. I mean, basically it seems it's, it's funny if, if you aren't able to keep up on the technology uh, you know, the guys now are so good at utilizing it and, and, and it, it helps so much with figuring out what the fish are doing, where they're at, what, what type of stuff you're fixing, you know, fishing that, if you don't know how to use it and you can't, you're not able to keep up on the technology, you're going to get left behind. You know what I don't like about electronics, Larry Mack? What's that? I hate seeing them out. I, no. Well, that's one, that's one of them. That's fine. I've been out many a lake having to call customer service on this few, th few times. I, I will openly admit that. But what yeah, kills, like, how do you turn this thing on? <laughs> what, what kills me about electronics is when you're marking fish and you watch them sit there and they won't, and they just laugh at you when you try to put your lure down there. That's, you know, it's bad enough, you know, I, I don't need any harassment from the fish when I'm trying to relax. You know what I mean, Jonathan? Right. Yeah, exactly. There's nothing more frustrating than being like, hey, there they are, They're, you know, and then you're throwing and throwing and throwing and you can't get them to bite anything. You know, yeah. Well, now yeah. you can almost tell. It's like watching them on TV now. It's like Shark Week, man. You can actually tell what kind of fish it is almost. I mean, it's it is. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, you absolutely can. With yeah. the new live imaging and stuff, I mean, you can watch them swim. You can watch them chase bait. You can, I mean, you yeah. can watch every move that they make. 
and you can watch your lure go right by them and mm. have them not even look at it. Yeah, and then they stick their middle <laughs> yeah. fin up at you. It's just, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that, that brings up a good point, you know, just like on the hunting side with our show, and, and I know, you know, with Major League uh, uh, Fishing, their, their show, you know, people think that you're you're really crunching kind of the best of the best in 22 minutes. Uh, it's There's a lot of – there's there's a lot of super, super challenging uh, hunts that, that we go on to produce for our show that, you know, we have to produce a show, obviously something that's entertaining versus just watching people on the tree. I'm sure it's the same uh, in the bass boat as well, you know, uh, on the lake, you know, when you get, you got some days that are just hot to trot, you know, you can't do anything wrong. And, uh, and then a lot of days you have to work for it. So it's, it can, uh, you're seeing the best of the best, you know, so it's, I'm sure that, it's uh from the viewers per- perspective know that i mean even the for the pro fishermen they're out there fishing fishing you know figuring out the strategies just like we're fishing, figuring out strategy for whitetail or turkey uh whatever there's a lot of commonality there uh as far as far as that goes uh what lake i'm sure you you have fished i can't even probably count the amount of bodies of water that you launched a boat in uh but is there a lake that really stands out to you that you're like, I can't wait to go there? Yeah, there's a, I'm, I'm a, there's a number of them really. There is some of my favorite ones, uh, Table Rock Lake and, in, in uh, you know, Branson, Missouri. That's, that is one of my all time favorites to go to. And that place is just a fish factory and it's got big ones, but you just catch so many of them mm-hmm. when you go, when you go there, it's, it's it, just a lot of fun. It's a fun place to fish. It's beautiful scenery um you know everyone in in that area of the country is super super nice and they all love bass fishing so um i mean that that one sticks out to me for sure that i look forward to every time that i see it on the schedule uh and then the other one the other couple is being a northern guy from michigan uh i'm a smallmouth guru um and and anytime we get to go to any of those smallmouth fisheries like green bay or sturgeon bay in wisconsin or, or lake st Clair, um the here in michigan st lawrence river in upstate new york i look forward to those every time you know and, and those are i mean all those places are places that i go to just to fun fish for vacation or whatever you know mm-hmm. and it's uh those fisheries are just absolutely phenomenal um you know everyone everyone looks at the places like Florida and in Texas and, and some of those fisheries down there, they can be really good at certain times, but they can just be really, really tough. Um, you know, and, and I just, like I said, like most anglers, I like to go places where it's a uh, target rich environment. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> you get a, get a lot of action and, and uh, you know, not a lot of slow time during the day. And uh, you know, those, the, it seems like the Northern fisheries and, and some of those some of those places seem to shine a little bit in that aspect. But um, you know, between those handful there, I mean, those are by far my favorite places in the country. Yeah, Larry. Well, Larry and I. Well, Larry's still in Missouri. I grew up in Missouri. I moved up to Iowa t- yeah. 19 years ago. But Table Rock, Lake the Ozarks, those are always good fisheries. And but I, I, you know, one of my favorite, Jonathan and Larry. I don't know if you've ever been up there or not. But Jonathan, have you ever fished Lake Mille Lacs up in Minnesota? They got a lot of uh, smallies up there. Oh yeah, yep. I fished Mille Lacs a number of times. So actually, one of my really good friends is a guide on uh, on that lake, and um, I fished there a few times. I haven't fished there a ton. You know, it's hard for me to, um, you know, as great as Mille Lacs is for a smallmouth fishery, is one of the top three in the country. Um, wow, well, I didn't know it was that big. Oh well, yeah. yeah, yeah. I would say as far as as far as the quality of fish and just in the size for smallmouth specifically. It, Definitely top three, you know, right there with the St. Lawrence River and Lake St. Clair. Um, with the Lake St. Clair only being like two hours from my house. Oh, you can't I have leave. a little bit harder time driving, <laughs> you yeah. know, 12, 12 hours to get to Mille Lacs. Um, but it is, it is phenomenal up there. Yeah, you know how I know that's such a great smallmouth lake, Jonathan? Because when I'm walleye fishing, all I catch are smallmouth. i think we need to trade man come on 
Yeah, you get, just need to get the boat together. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, that the way down a win-win. Exactly. You can't keep the walleye up there. No, no, they got. I, no. Well, I think I think it's well. At last time I heard, it was a one fish limit. They might have changed that, but I think they, they did. They, okay. They, yeah, but they they're trying to get that fishery built back up for the walleye side, but. Yeah. yeah, in my uh, in my experience, and in, in here in Michigan, it's against the law. It was my personal law to release a walleye. Oh, you can't, man. That's the best <laughs> eating fish out there, almost, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Dan's favorite place to fish is at the at the seafood counter. On <laughs> <laughs> That's where he knows he's going to come home with something. Yeah. That's fact. <laughs> Remember when I told you that you shouldn't claim knowing him, Jonathan? This is this is one of the reasons why. Yeah. So how'd you like how'd you like going out west with Larry and the guys? I had a blast. You know that was uh, that was a, a fun, just a real fun hunt with a great great group of guys. Um, and you know that was really that was my first one of my first experiences bow hunting out west. And and since that time, I've been on multiple <laughs> multiple yeah. hunts out there and it's just from a for a midwest uh midwest hunter sitting in a tree stand and uh you know and that's how you know i didn't grow up spotting stock nothing or you know what i mean i we grew up sitting in tree stands just waiting for them to come to us you know and i just i love going out west and and putting the boots on the ground and and just you know out trying to outwork everybody and making you, you kind of make your own uh success when you're able to do that in certain situations and uh and i love i love that it's just it's figuring out the puzzle and, and uh you know i mean the hardest part that i have is is finding a finding a buddy or somebody that can keep up with me when i want to when i because every yeah. time <laughs> i look it's like well, if I can just get over the top of that ridge over there, I can see this other side, and it's just it's just a never-ending cycle. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's like, man, and then oh, the next hill, that's where they're going to yeah, be. Yeah, exactly. The next hill. Yeah. <laughs> the thing that's cool about well, was cool about that hunt is early season. A lot of people, you know, obviously they focus on food, uh, but no one like it in Nebraska, for instance. You know, the bean fields at that time of year, it's when they're just starting to turn. So. Like day one when we when we uh, when we arrived there at that camp, it was like there's there's deer all over the beans, yep. and this field may totally change because the 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 field starting to turn. I mean within a day, and then the same deer we'd see a mile or what away in another field that hadn't started turning yet. It's like they just gravitate. So really just just putting our heads together, coming up with a good strategy, and and uh, it ended up working out that trip though. We we had one heck of a one heck of a hunt uh for sure on on that trip we uh i think josh was there he shot a really good mule deer yeah. he shot a really good mule deer uh some of the other guys killed white tails and just having that that flexibility to be able to have a tag that is really truly for either or a white tail or a mule deer uh it's it's pretty awesome because you never know what you're going to run across was uh, was that the trip yeah, the, where you put the pretzels in phillips boots uh <laughs> I believe it probably was. Uh, yeah, there was yep, I, I believe it probably was. Yeah, yeah we uh, ended up hit bigs. We spot and stalked that whitetail uh, Paul Big shot, and yeah, we man, yeah, it was just yeah. it was just an awesome, an awesome trip. And like, once you go out west and get to experience that, I mean, it does give you the bug. It's like you just can't wait to go back, uh, just because there is an element of challenge that that comes first. You got to find them, then you got to construct, you know. What kind of strategy strategy am I going to use to actually get up close enough uh, to present an opportunity? But uh, it's like you said, Jonathan. It's it's it is. It'll give you the bug and make you just want to keep going back for more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the uh, where else have you been? Uh, I've been a been a handful this year. I you know I had a pretty tough season this year, but I mean since that trip, honestly, I think that same year I went to. Uh, I went to New Mexico, mule deer hunting out there in southern New Mexico. Um, kind of like the, I don't know if you call it like the plains almost. It was almost like, uh, like it reminded me a lot of Texas, you know, like that brush mm-hmm. country kind of pretty flat, you know, but there was some, there was definitely some, you know, we were kind of on like the, you know, the, the bases of the mountains, some of the flats and stuff down in there chasing the, uh, chasing mule deer. And I shot a really nice, 
me and deer there uh, actually after that was that same fall um you know once i left nebraska with you guys which you know that was that that one really gave me the bug on the mule deer, especially because I I shot my that was my very first mule deer that I that I shot there. Oh, with um, us, yeah, yeah, with you guys. And then uh, you know, I actually got to watch Josh shoot his with 170 some incher. That yeah. was you know I was watching through the spot and scope across the valley because I had already tagged out, but I just I didn't want to sit at camp, so I'm like I'll just go sit over here in glass, you know. Right. And um, so that was cool. And then you know went to I. Uh, I ended up going into Mexico and I harvested a hundred is 186 inch mule deer there. Wow. Um, and then from then on, I've been back to New Mexico again. I still hunt the Midwest as much as possible. I actually hunt, uh, just South of you in Des Moines there, uh, this last year I was down there muzzle for late muzzle season. Cool. Um, and then, and I've got a couple of hunts planned for this year. I'm going to actually to Southern Colorado for for mule deer again there and then uh going to saskatchewan for whitetail up there well you know we that's got the one... go ahead Larry. go ahead Dan. oh i was just gonna say that's one thing that uh, that i learned about you real quick you you know you're not afraid of of putting in the work and and we had we had a common uh friend down in kansas uh down around el dorado uh yeah. there that we just that, that we actually just found out when we were in hunt camp together and and since then, when I'd go down and, and visit uh, Chad down there, you know, your all's property that you hunted were right there close. And 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 then we started conversing and, and just the strategy that you put behind uh, that. I can only imagine, uh, you know, what you do, you know, whenever you launch a boat, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> it's, like you know, it's it's just how, how it all comes together, you know, just just being out, outdoors, whether it be hunting, fishing, or whatever, there's always, you know, you got to figure it out, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's a fact. And that's, that's what really, what I absolutely love about it. You know, I mean, it, to, to me, the, the uh, success of a hunt isn't the harvesting of the animal. It's, it's in the same with the same with fishing, the success of the day isn't necessarily what you catch. It's figuring out the puzzle, um, you know, and, and, and what, you know, what you, sh- what you should be doing, where to set up, like the same thing in, you know, fishing, where to go, where to, where you would need to be at certain times and, 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 and other things. And it's, and that's what, you know, the, the, one of the things I love the most about this industry and, and like, and all my closest friends, uh, you know, that I've met all over the country have, have all been because of hunting and fishing. I mean, I, we all just love the, um, you know, love the outdoors and, and enjoy all those aspects that go into it. And, and that's the, you know, that's what just keeps you going keeps you coming back for more, you know, and, and that uh, I love the adventure and seeing new places, you know, I mean, the, the amount of windshield time that I've spent driving around the country, you know, and, and especially going out West hunting, you know, there's, there's, and, and it kind of crossed my mind as a little bit of like a surreal, um, you know, like, thought process that hit me one day is as i was driving across oklahoma on my way down to uh new mexico and one of the most beautiful sunsets i've ever seen in my life and i'm sitting there and i'm like you know what there's people that live in cities and and nothing against cities uh, but there's people that live in the cities that will never ever see this and have no idea what what's in what what their the rest of the country has to offer yeah, I, you know, I, just... I echo that 100%. I say that all the time on the radio. You know, I feel sorry for the people that never get out and hear that first turkey gobble or hear that buck snort or make a, watch them make a scrape. They just have no idea what they're missing, Jonathan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I hear you. Well, we got about a couple minutes left. Uh, folks, if you're going to uh, check the, the podcast out, don't forget now, if you send us a question to read on the air, you're going to get uh, – some nice swag courtesy of Arctic Ice and uh, Sportsman's Warehouse. It's called Now That's Cool segment. All you got to do is just uh, send us an email. Go to outdoorsdan.com or check out respectthegametv.tv and send us a question to read or, you know, uh, just want to say hi, check in, uh, like the podcast. If we read it here on the podcast, you're going to win. So that's uh, Now That's Cool brought to you by Arctic Ice. Hey, Jonathan, when are you going to start? When do you start getting hot and heavy on the trail? No, we kick off here in uh, another couple of weeks. I'm actually got my boat 
here in the shop now we're rigging it up putting all the putting all the electronics on it hanging the motor and all that so we'll be uh we'll be kicking off here uh right here first of march or in down in texas actually we're gonna go to sam rayburn for the first event of the year so i'm uh, looking forward to uh getting out of these below zero temperatures and down in texas which uh, currently it's not much warmer but um <laughs> looking yeah. forward to getting down there at least at least to some soft water you know yeah are you <laughs> are you going to get a chance to tune turkey hunting at all oh yeah yeah i'll do uh i'll do i arguably will i'll argue with anybody that's we have some of the best turkey hunting in the planet right here by my house and it's uh, it's, it's just crazy. The number of, of birds that we have around here. Um, you know, I think I've got a group of 200 of them or something that wow. are right on my property. Um, they, they disappear in the spring for the most part, but they're <laughs> there now. They're I looked out the window the other day and they were digging up my yard, trying to find anything they could to eat in the snow. But, um, but I do a ton of turkey hunting and, uh, I'm look, really looking forward to, uh, you know, the spring and, in in the, you know, getting out there and, and chasing a couple of big gobblers. I don't, I don't think I'll get to travel much for turkey season because generally we're busy fishing, but, um, when I'm home, I'll definitely, you know, make time to get out there. I know one thing we're going to make time for, we're going to make time for getting on a hunt together again. That's for sure. Uh, I'll, uh, I might have to get with you on that because i want to make sure that we can share another another awesome hunt camp together uh here in the near future absolutely absolutely man looking forward to it i guess i've told you before if you ever need anybody to fill a hunt camp i'm only a phone call away yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, i hope that works better for you than it does for me jonathan <laughs> <laughs> dan dan is a professional deer watcher uh, <laughs> yep if for, he is he's he's good at spotting them good at watching them walk in real close and good at watching them walk off <laughs> hey now i got i got great video too of some really nice shooters at the decoy now come on yeah, yeah. there you go yeah, yeah. yeah. just you trying did. to yeah. make sure you get some good content for the show Eric. thank you jonathan <laughs> thank you that's exactly what i'm trying to help with uh, yeah he is you know but you know they say oh it's all about the story but you know one of my favorite parts is the ending and that's, uh, <laughs> Dan's, story, uh, Dan's story is just continue to go on, go on, and on. ending no, in some back straps on the grill yeah. <laughs> yeah, in all serious uh dan shot actually harvested in iowa there an incredible six points this year uh i was actually looking at the footage the other day i was like my gosh i think that's probably one of the that's a, one of the bigger six points I think I've ever seen. Uh, so yeah, and, uh, he he roasted him. I was like, he's like, he calls me up. He's like, man, I, man, I got him. I hit him. I may hit him just a fuzz back or whatever. And and so he gave him a little bit. Goes and looks, and he he died across, right across the river when it was super cold out. And so I got to see Dan uh, swimming. Give his tra yeah, yeah. trying <laughs> try to cross cross the river to get those deer. Yeah. Uh, so it's the first time I'd seen the footage. It's pretty pretty comical for sure which that'll be coming up on the show <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome rr real funny yeah. one yeah. question for you jonathan real quick what's your go-to your go-to bait hmm man that's a that's a tough one you know as, as a I try not to have a specific you know that i have to have to throw but everybody has like you know, the techniques that they're the most comfortable with and, and, uh, and just that confidence bait when nothing else working, something you can pick up and you got confidence that you can go anywhere in the country and catch them. Um, you know, for me, i I love drop shot fishing. Uh, that's, that's something that I always, always have tied on. Um, but I would probably have to say that just the best all round, uh, now would be a vibrating jig, um, like a, you know, a chatter bait or something, mm -hmm. something like that, you know, that, that you can use from one end of the country to the other. And it's something that I always have at least one or two of them tied on with, in different colors. And, uh, and it, it's a, just absolutely super effective presentation for anywhere. Yeah. Hey, Jonathan, for somebody listening and doesn't know what a drop shot is, can you explain that real quick? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, drop shots, just a, it's kind of a evolved technique, uh, came out of the Western States, California and some of those other, um, you know, high pressured, high pressured lakes, uh, it, for a drop shot is it's going to be, um, basically you'll have your main line, you'll have a hook tied onto it and then you'll, your weight 
will be on a leader, um, we'll probably roughly 12 to 18 inches below your your lure. So um, most cases it's a, a worm, small worm, or uh, some sort of um, you know minnow type bait that that you'll have above it. And then basically you're it's going to keep that that bait's going to be up off the bottom, uh, you know, where the fish can see it. And it's just a great presentation for. Uh, for especially for highly pressured areas or any sort of clear water types yeah. of lakes as well. Often used down there at Table Rock, right, Larry Mac? Yes, 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 it Absolutely. is for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, I, I'm I'm expecting a, uh, an invite to maybe uh, maybe hop in a truck on the way down to Table Rock. You know, and some someone teach me a thing or two about fishing Table Rock because I've I haven't spent a lot of time on there. Um, Absolutely. At least of like, yeah. So we might have to hop in a boat together and you show me a thing or two. That sounds fair. You know, we can, I'll share a hunting camp with you and then you can share the fishing boat with me. I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're getting ready to wrap up guys. Hey, Jonathan, if someone wants to find out more information about you or follow you uh, through major league fishing or some of the other events that you're doing, how can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've got all the social media channels and hop on the Facebook, um, you know, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, all the normal social media avenues. And then as well as when the events are going on, you can go to majorleaguefishing.com or hop on their app and you can get the real time, um, you know, live score tracker of how the events are going. So there's a, a lot of different ways to follow the sport now, which is awesome. That's awesome. Well, listen, thanks for doing the podcast with us. I really enjoyed just getting to meet you through the podcast today. And I look forward to visiting with you again. Uh, Larry Mack, where can they find us on Respect the Game TV? Oh, you can go to uh, all the social media, uh, Instagram, just Respect the Game TV, Respect the Game uh, TV on Facebook as well. You can go to our website uh, and go over to YouTube and subscribe to the Respect the Game TV YouTube channel too. We have a lot of new content, fresh content going up every single week uh, going into turkey season. We've got a lot of new stuff we're going to be sharing as well. So, uh, uh, be be watching there. Go over and subscribe. There you go. And go watch us decap some turkeys. It's, it's that time of year, folks. <laughs> hey, that's going to wrap it up for Larry Mack, Jonathan, Van Dam, and myself. I want to thank you for tuning in today. This podcast is brought to you by the fine folks at Sportsman's Warehouse. Over 112 locations nationwide, only a click away at sportsmans.com. And don't forget about Artie Guys. It should take, you should take it everywhere to help keep your stuff cool. We'll be right back next week. Keep it here when you can. It's all outdoors with Outdoors Dan and Larry Mack, the podcast. See you next week, folks. And soon it's coming to take everything you know. Yeah. When the monster crawls out of the sea, you're going to need somebody.